Hi, welcome to Connecting Voices, a TV show dedicated to producing news on social justice issues for specifically ages 15 to 24 years old. My name is Lydia Stetson and today we're discussing the overlook of mental illnesses in communities of color. We have our guests today, Dior de Vargas, a Latina feminist and also mental health activist, and another guest, Shamika Goddard, um, a survivor of a mental illness. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So um, I'd like to just start off the show with a quote from an article of the National Alliance of Mental Illnesses that I felt was pretty important is recently published. So um, it's a quote from the article is that in 1999, the Surgeon General released Mental Health, a report of the Surgeon General. This report acknowledged that not all Americans, especially minorities, receive equal mental health treatment, a finding that prompted the Surgeon General to release a supplemental report on disparities in mental health care for people of color. The supplement, which was published in 2001, sends one clear message, culture counts. So mm. to what extent do you guys agree with the statement in the article? Mm. Well, I, I definitely feel like the piece about culture counting is paramount to mental health, obviously health in general, but um, with something like mental health, because it's an internal issue that people don't physically see. So people have misconceptions and prejudices already about mental health um, to then layer in the intersectionality of a person's race or ethnicity um, also magnifies those prejudices, those misconceptions and those stereotypes. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think that for people of color, they're more often severely diagnosed or misdiagnosed and mm -hmm. so I think that that's really important and I think that that can cause a lot of stress on the person because mm -hmm. when you're misdiagnosed you're going through a whole lot of other things and so mm -hmm. I think it's really important for people to have cultural competency when it comes to training mental health professionals mm -hmm. as well as just anybody in terms of like support groups or anything like that I, again I really agree mm -hmm. that culture is par uh, paramount when it comes to mental health treatment mm -hmm. yeah all right, mm -hmm. so um, question for Shamika. So um, do you feel like when you were going through your um, time of mental illnesses, were the health care services provided, were they beneficiary, or how did you feel about it? Well, so the idea is I live with uh, bipolar one. So they, I've had episodes that were very public uh, when I was younger, and most people with uh, bipolar disorder will have their first break in their early 20s, usually when people are in college. Um, so when you add something like stress and different schedules in a new space and all of these things, that's sort of, is sort of the prime Petri dish for these sorts of things to, to onset. But when I was first diagnosed, it was years after the actual um, bipolar disorder started to manifest in my life. So I had um, different characteristics where I was behaving differently um, when I was in school, but I didn't know why. Um, and it wasn't until I started to see and hear things that no one else could see and hear. And I had a very public um, psychotic break when I thought the apocalypse was going on, on the day of the Virginia Tech shooting, which only confirmed that my apocalyptic vision was real. Um, but it happened in a hospital. And from that moment, I was hospitalized for two weeks. And it for the next couple of years, it took time to figure out who I was going to see and how I was going to see them and not having money, meaning I wasn't going to be able to get medication or therapy, like all of these uh, different variables were involved. And so when I look back on the health care I did receive, it took a very long time to finally find a person who was willing to listen to me, who was willing to um, be a part of my holistic view of trying to treat my bipolar as opposed to just therapy or just uh, medication. And there were times when fi actually finding someone who was taking patients, who was taking my insurance, like these are issues that anyone with mental health has, but for uh, people of color who are often people who have um, lower income at times, it, it is even more difficult because you're dealing with a different um, set of issues. So I feel like there were aspects of the health that I received where I was being handled, so to speak, as opposed to being seen as, as a person um, with bipolar. I was seen as bipolar or 
sort of the same thing as like calling someone schizophrenic as opposed to a person who has schizophrenia. So it's like first person language and it bled through into the experience that I had. Mm. In your experiences with um, working with people of color who are dealing with mental illnesses, how do you think they handled it with health care services? Um, so I do want to be um, uh, open and honest. I do um, have a mental illness as well and I'm within my activism I'm trying to use language that's more sensitive and more appropriate so maybe more towards mental health challenges or struggles right. or issues um, but um, in my experience uh, when I was hospitalized I felt very much like they needed to get me out of the psychiatric ward it was kind of mm -hmm. like we have a certain amount of beds we kind of mm -hmm. need you to get better as soon as possible mm -hmm. it was you know they would watch you and take notes and, and I always felt like okay so I have to perform like a normal person in order mm -hmm. for them to feel like I'm getting better. And it, it was a really hard time. I mean, it took a lot mm -hmm. and a long time for me to finally find something that worked for me, mm -hmm. going through multiple medications, um, mm -hmm. going through different therapists. I think that it's really difficult. And also go working with mental health professionals who, are not to say that white Caucasian uh, mental health professionals can't be helpful, but personally for me, I felt like I couldn't have a connection with them unless they were someone of color where mm -hmm. I could use a specific language that was close to me and my family and mm -hmm. they would not and I would get some validation in that mm -hmm. sense. And so mm -hmm. I think it's really important for people of color to, while there is so many reasons why they wouldn't want to get in involved or find the help because mm -hmm. again, there's just so much history that makes them be distrustful of, of the profession or of just the overall mental health care system. I think um, I think it's important for us to, you know, just be, sorry, um, you could obviously edit that, but I think it's important for um, us to think about how this is affecting our family members and how, mm -hmm. you know, I think this might be a risk we have to take because the mental mm -hmm. health of our, of our family, our community, is extremely important. I mean, mm -hmm. the attempted suicide rate of Latinos is so high. I mean, we it, this is kind of a life or death situation, and I think mm -hmm. we have to find a way to prioritize mental health in our communities. Great, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> awesome. So um, now we're actually going to um, watch a video that you did with um, who is missing in media in the past. So um, we're just going to play that. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of body issues when it comes to being Latina. Um, I remember growing up and being called gordita, but that's like a term of endearment, but not to, in, in this society, it's not. And so it's very much like, and you have to eat everything on your plate. And so there's no way of like knowing when to stop eating. There's, you know, when to stop when the plate is empty because that's just a sign of disrespect if you don't eat all of your food. And so it's like, oh, you're getting too fat or, but then you have to eat everything on your plate. So it's like this constant struggle and then feeling like an other where, you know, you want to be connected with your other Latina classmates or friends and you feel like you need to be very Americanized and you might be misunderstood. And so I think there's a lot of identity issues going on. And so we're in constant um, a feud with, within ourselves because also we have, you know, family members who are from other countries. And so they're very much like keeping their, their pride in their country. But then in America, we're trying to be a very Americanized so that we can move forward because we feel like that's the only way that we can, you know, improve upon ourselves and our family. My name is Dira Vargas and I grew up in New York and I am a Latina feminist mental health activist. I was born in Manhattan and my mom was born in Manhattan as well, but my father was born in Ecuador. Latino suffers from depression, I feel like that's something that I haven't really focused on in my life, but it's just so part of who I am as a, as a young woman. And so I feel like I need to focus more on my activism on that, where there's so many, like Latinos are the highest uh, in terms of like committing suicide or attempting it at least. And so I feel like there's something there that we need to focus on. And I know there've been other people who've written books about it, but I feel that there needs to be a perspective from someone who actually suffers from it on a daily basis and who you know grew up and 
you know, had to be on welfare and, you know, constantly getting eviction notices and not knowing when my next meal would come. And so something like that. And so I just feel like I needed, needed to give um, people a perspective that others might not necessarily have. So it's something I'm really, really passionate about. And I want to be able to remove the stigma that mental health has on the Latino community. like two extremes it's one is that you know loca she's crazy you know you don't know what's wrong with her like she needs to snap out of it and you know you're a little scared about how she's she's feeling um and then there's the other extreme where it's like are you kidding me like it's not that serious we don't have the luxury of being depressed we're always we just have to snap out of it and be hard working and fight and you know, make money and to just be, uh, sustain, you know, just to sustain ourselves. And so we, um, it's very much like it's something that only white people experience because they have the money to pay a shrink every every week or however often they see that person. And it, they view it as maybe like whining and saying, oh, well, this is not fair. That's not fair. But Latinos are, are portrayed as people who are strong and who just keep on moving forward and are survivors. And so you can be a survivor in your own way. It's 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 a mental uh, illness, so it's not something that you can necessarily control. So um, I just feel that people need to realize that that's it's a normal thing. A lot of Latinos suffer from mental illness, and it's it's not something that people should be ashamed of because it's normal. I just really want to get more involved with other uh, young Latinas who are suffering and feel like they're, you know, at the end of the rope and um, at, at the end of their rope and that they, there's no way they can know where they can go. And so they can look up to me. I'm not, I'm not amazing, but I'm, I've moved forward despite the things that I've been through in life and still suffering from depression. It's an ongoing illness. And so I want them to know that they can come to people like me because I've experienced it. I still do. And I'm still working every day in order to make my family proud, make my culture proud. And so um, I think it's really important for, for me to continue working on mental health. Thank you, that was really interesting. So um, you mentioned in the video that um, mental health challenges are often sort of labeled as white people diseases. So what do you think the f effect of that is on youth in communities of color today? Um, so I think that a lot of young people don't see themselves represented when it comes to mental health challenges. And so I think that they see that as, as not their issue and that, oh, I, whatever I'm feeling, this is going to pass or, you know, I'm being too weak. And so I think that in order for our community to prioritize this, I think that the media representation of mental illness or mental health challenges mm -hmm. needs to include people of color because if you don't see someone that looks like you, then this is not your issue. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's why a lot of young people just don't feel like they can come to terms with it or accept that they're dealing with something that serious. Yeah, especially in like um, pop culture, you always see like for a lot of young people, it seems like having, you know, dealing with something like depression or bipolar disorder, it's something really looked down on. You can even see it in like, the terms that are usually used by like young people such as like draking which is refers to being sort of the rapper drake and is a more emotional songs and also like you know catching feelings so i mean what do you feel like the effect of that is the fact that they're using these terms and what is it on what is the effect of that i think it's a strategic form of silencing that's done sort of in all areas of our society if there's a behavior that isn't deemed like heteronormative as in everybody should be doing it and heteronormative is is usually um white heterosexual um, men in particular but if that's not their culture then anything deviating from it is wrong and so in order to get people closer to the heteronormative preferred culture there's forms of silencing or pushing people or, or making them feel ashamed or uh, making them feel guilty or any number of these things about the way that they are, the way that they act, feel, or behave so that they'll sort of get in line. And I think when I hear things like um, people being called, uh, like they're catching feelings, I think of women who are called hysterical. Mm -hmm. And so that then means as a woman, I'm not able to show my feelings authentically. 
uh, without being called hysterical and without those feelings being immediately dis, um, uh, disvalued and disengaged and uh, these these sorts of things in uh, mental health in particular are very dangerous because that then tells people that I'm not experiencing potentially depression that I need to get checked out and looked at and figured out this is something I need to deal with on my own this is something I need to sort of figure out how to get rid of and people aren't able to access the fullness of their experience good bad and otherwise but then also eventually seek the help that they may need mm -hmm. so I guess like if we're looking back at it in more of a like how it affects um, the whole community. How do you think like this overlook and misunderstanding of mental health challenges and communities of color, how does it affect like our legal system in America, would you say? Do you, does it have an effect? Mm -hmm. I mean, yes. I mean, there's countless, and I, I hate the fact that there are countless examples mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that I can give in terms of how black people in general are treated in the criminal justice system, but then in addition, yes, Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. in addition to there, someone with a mental illness. Right. Just recently, this poor man, he, he had no weapons. He was, he was harmless, and the fact that they shot him, like, yeah. it didn't make any sense. Yeah. And I think that, and some of these instances, these people had the education, or supposedly they right. had the mental health training right. necessary. Right. And again, they didn't use it, and mm -hmm. again, they went straight to using violence. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, obviously, you can tell how pissed off I'm oh, getting. Oh, about well, this. yes. And I, I, there was another. There was a similar story of a, of a woman who was about my age. As I, when I heard about this, it stopped me in my day. I mean, any time anyone is tragically killed, is already a tragedy. Um, but there's a story of a woman um, in the middle of last year or so who was having an episode. Her family called 911. They sent the police. She was going to go with them. Something happened. The story of the police and the story of the family, of course, are different. But what ended up happening was she was killed by the police. And she, her body was left in the ground. Her skirt was up. Like, there's all of these other things that happened. But I feel like when there's mental uh, health challenges involved in dealing with police um, or mental health challenges in trying to navigate, um, just navigate your community, that adds a layer of because people are have a, either they feel like their lives are in danger or they feel like there's they feel uncomfortable. Like I feel like whenever people are uncomfortable, that's when there it's you know it's a trigger happy moment for like violence or that misunderstanding is a great excuse for people to just lash out. Uh, unfortunately, I guess how would you? What are your advice on eliminating this stigma in communities of color? You were talking about education before and things like that, but I mean, mm -hmm. when you're looking at like like a family or just like a, a culture, a race, like how something that's been around for so long, how do you change mm -hmm. that? I mean, nothing happens overnight. It's gonna it's gonna yeah. take a while. But again, just having these conversations and again with education, I think it's yeah. that's how people can prioritize that and yeah. tackle these issues. Um, yeah, and when I think education, I think watching a movie because I love learning things through YouTube or watching a film. I think ha Holly Berry did a film recently, and I, I forget the name of it, but it's a film that depicts her issues with a mental health challenge. And I thought it was fantastic. She had to go to Canada, unfortunately, to film it. Because American pe or U.S. people have no idea how to treat people of color in these sorts of roles. But these sorts of opportunities to, to physically see a different kind of story, that's a form of education because it offers you a different, a different narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's also being able to learn how to critically consume media. So if you are a young person and you're constantly viewing things, looking at magazines, playing video games and whatnot, you also want to not just be passive and receive whatever images and translations of, of society that you're being given, but you also want to step back and say, who was this made for? What is their message? What are they trying to tell me? Do I agree? And with this critical eye, you can also educate yourself on when you do see someone that is being portrayed as having a mental health challenge in a film or a TV show or something, you can start to, to question, you know, that doesn't sound right, and maybe I should look more into what people with schizophrenia actually look like. I remember being terrified of schizophrenic people, but once I had made a friend with schizophrenia, 
they were so normal. I was shocked. Oh my gosh. Arms, legs, the whole bit. So I feel <laughs> like making friends with different kinds of people, really talking to people, hearing people's stories, but then also telling your own. So I yes. feel like, like I said, the one in four people, you might be that one in four. Yeah, I think that's that's really important. And mm -hmm. seeing someone that, you know, looks like your, your friend or your sister or, you know, just right. seeing these individuals and humanizing mm -hmm. the experience. Yes. I think that focusing less on statistics and more on the people's experiences mm -hmm. and hearing their stories mm -hmm. can make it something that people can maybe take in a lot more easier, you know, easily. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, and again, just, I mean, Shamika was part of my uh, photo project and I'm True. honored to have her as, as part of that project and seeing people and humanizing experiences saying, oh, she looks like my sister or mm -hmm. these are people who are high functioning individuals they can accomplish a lot mental illness is not a death sentence you can right. do whatever you want to do in your life that is so true it doesn't stop you mm -hmm. yes and i i have now found that when i tell people my story it becomes almost like a testimony because like i said i was taken to a mental institution i was my mother tells me this story because i was completely gone at that point they told her to make long-term arrangements because they didn't know what was going to happen and Thankfully, I was, I say, uh, given my, my right mind, quote unquote, enough to leave the institution. And then after that started uh, this life of living with bipolar. But because of that experience and because of the, the work that's gone in afterwards of being able to, to really give people a different story to go with and for myself also being able to, to tell people about it, it does, it does change people's minds. It really does. It changes people's minds about what they think. So how do you think, I guess, government officials and then maybe civilians and society in general, how can they, what can they do to help like, get re justice for these mm. people of color dealing mm -hmm. with mental health challenges? I mean, education, mental health, first aid training. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think people need to, again, prioritize this in, in, in their lives and in, in you know, I know that there are a couple of bills coming out or, or yeah. like, you know, the, the Tim Murphy one. Um, I mean, there are a whole bunch of them. And I think that people need to, you know, think about how mental health has an effect on everyone. I mm -hmm. mean, you don't even have to be diagnosed with right. a, a mental health challenge or mental illness. Like you, a mental mm -hmm. health is extremely important for everyone, as right. is physical health. And I think people need to be aware of that. Yeah, I'm totally mm -hmm. for prevention. I think that yeah. having these conversations early on in, mm -hmm. in elementary schools, and it, you don't have to use yeah. certain language, but mm -hmm. just in terms of like checking in with kids and right. how are you doing, how, how are things going? Like, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's yeah. something as simple as that, that yeah. can, you know, really have a, a long term mm -hmm. effect on mm -hmm. how people, you know, people's self esteem, on people's, you know, mental health. And so right. prevention right. is key. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of great work being done right now about around eating disorders and body image. Um, and if you like Instagram and places like Twitter and stuff, they, they have policies and they have information about if you feel like this, these kinds of things are happening to you, if you're experiencing these kinds of symptoms, here's some resources. So mm -hmm. there's becoming uh, a trend to have more responsibility from like social media to be involved in these conversations since it's so ubiquitous. Um, and I feel like the same is true. Like if I now that I have more information about what the symptoms of bipolar or what the symptoms of depression might be, then maybe I should talk to somebody and, and it's said to talk to someone at my school. And so I'll, you know, so just coaching people and giving them that kind of information early and often, mm -hmm. I, it can make such a huge difference. And I also think the use of social media is really important. And yeah. even in terms of like how Facebook is, you know, implementing that mm -hmm. within, like a lot of people are open on social media and saying, I'm True. having a really hard day. and. Mm -hmm. they have this new thing where they're give it, giving an option to people to report, you know, and uh, again, with, you know, having, being respect of someone's privacy, but yeah. Yeah. kind of giving them resources like, hey, you know, our, your friend kind of hinted at us that you're having a hard time. These are certain things that you yeah. can look to and reach out to in terms of resources. And so I think mm -hmm. that it's important to use yeah. the tools that we have in our disposal mm -hmm. in order to help people. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree. That's true. Mm -hmm. So do you guys have any final thoughts or final things you want to say? Um, I just want to say recovery is is possible and it's mm -hmm. different for everyone. I don't want people to think that 
you have to do certain things in order to recover because yeah. I can't tell you how one yeah. should live their life and how to get better. So mm -hmm. that's one thing I want to say. Um, yes, um, and I would also say, so for the three out of four who don't have a mental uh, health challenge, I would encourage you to find that fourth person in your life who does. Because if they haven't told you yet, then they're struggling either without knowing it or they're struggling on their own. Uh, so I encourage those uh, individuals to do that. And then for that one out of four person, I just encourage you to keep going. Because mm -hmm. every day that I haven't got out of, gotten out of my bed and I feel like this defeat, I also feel like, you know what? There is another day ahead of me. And I have access to it if I but keep going. Right? So... Someone once explained it to me one day at a time, which was super frustrating because I'm very impatient, mm -hmm. but it was also some of the best advice. When I was at my lowest and I had no job, I wasn't in school, and I was dealing with this mental health challenge away from home, so I didn't even have my family with me, that was all I had was one day at a time. And I have now been blessed to be able to continue my uh, education and then also start a business and move forward in the work that I feel called to do. And I would not have been able to do that um, if I had given up on myself. So as I continue to not give up on myself, I will encourage you all to do the same. Mm -hmm. And if someone is interested in learning more about your activism, is there any social media that, or links they can contact? Um, they can go on my website, DiorVargas.com. Um, they can also look at my Twitter. It's at Dior Vargas. Um, I, what else do I use? Um, I use Tumblr. I mean, I use a whole bunch of different things, but you can go by my name, you know, Dior Vargas, D-I-O-R-V-A-R-G-A-S, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I want to be a resource for individuals. I want them to know that they're not alone, that mm -hmm. I deal with depression every single day. It's not easy, but as you get older you kind of learn how to tackle these issues you can learn more about yourself and know right. what your triggers are but right. and I digress but letting people know that they can come to me if they can't find a resource I don't have a problem googling it and searching for it and mm -hmm. taking my time to do that because I think we need to be there to help one another because mm -hmm. we are in different parts of our recovery and parts mm -hmm. of what we're dealing with and so having someone that they can come to I think is extremely important and knowing that someone cares I think that's mm -hmm. so I want to be a resource for individuals mm -hmm. okay. thank you so much for coming to the show thank you thank really you appreciate it us. so um, uh, thank you for watching connecting voices uh, my name is Lydia Stetson and stay tuned